Scrapping up stockers, Zach the stock cropper. The end of uh, 2020 is here. Holla frickin' Luya. With that comes uh, the crunching of numbers and I've uh, promised for several months now that I would have that and I finally had the time here over Christmas with it being a four day holiday to sit down and put something together that I feel semi comfortable in uh, presenting. So without further ado, Here's how things shook out for the project in 2020. So before I dive into the numbers, I want to reiterate a couple of the goals of what uh, the system was set up to do and why we set up to do it. So the number one reason that this, you know, that we sat down last February and came up with stock cropping was we wanted to have a system that was more economically sustainable for farmers and allowed them to retain a bigger share of the pie by doing things in a little bit different fashion and allowing them to stack enterprises on top of each other rather than just having single monocrops. How do we diversify? How do we cross leverage, uh, you know, different biological systems together to give the farmer an opportunity to make more money uh, with, uh, with less land, essentially, or not require a farmer to scale to make more money. Uh, find ways to make more money off the land they have. That was the general gist of what we were striking out to do. So I want to emphasize that before I go through, it gives a little bit better context, especially for people that are watching this for the first time, of what this project was all about. Okay, so diving into the numbers here. Uh, the first thing that I'm going to touch on and uh, throw up here is the cost of our barn. We had a lot of questions about what's your barn cost? Are you worried about your cost of animal space. Uh, the reality is the barn was an incredibly successful piece. You know, we didn't lose a single animal uh, out of it. We had a lot of people tell us that that was going to be the case. We'd have predator issues. Our pigs would dig out. Um, you know, there's some slight improvements that we want to make to our barn, but, uh, you know, credit to Sheldon and his design. It was a success, uh, a very big one uh, this first year. So uh, when you look at the numbers of what we spent, um, you know, about 15 grand is what we had into it uh, for our uh, materials. Now we know that uh, there's some things there that uh, that can be changed and we can likely uh, uh, lighten the barn up and uh, hopefully cheapen up construction uh, of it as well. But there's also some added features that we'd like to put in. So I think we're just gonna go roll with this $15,000 barn cost. If we amortize that over a, a seven year you know, uh, payoff that gives us a manageable payment of about $2,600 a year per barn to, uh, to base things off of. So if we move on and look at um, the cost of our feeder animals and our feed costs for the year, I'm not gonna dwell a lot on this. And, and I did do some rounding, this may not be exact. So for people that really wanna dive into the numbers, go ahead and I know there may be some inaccuracies here, but the, the basic cost of what we spent on things are right. These numbers down here are really, really close to what our outputs were. So about $1,870 for uh, uh, the, the acquisition price of animals and about the same dollar amount, 1870 bucks is uh, roughly what our feed bill was for the year. So when, when you look at uh, those things, this is, uh, I've built an Excel spreadsheet that tracks all this stuff and cross calculates, but this is what our total annual expenses came up to be for the barn. And when I say per acre, I mean a barn, the barn was designed essentially to travel across a single acre. And that makes for easy math when figuring all this stuff out as well. So if we look at our um, expenses down the line here, we have land rent, um, the cost of the barn, just for overall general repairs, cost of the livestock, cost of establishing the pasture per acre, livestock feed. This figured uh, 20 minutes a day at $30 an hour for labor. Uh, for juices time to be out there. And then we put in $50 for machinery costs, you know, figuring that uh, eventually down the road, we're gonna have to have, you know, a, a ranger or something to, uh, to tend, um, you know, this out. We wanted to assign some, uh, some cost for that as well. So total expenses per acre, uh, you know, for the barn acre of about $8,200 uh, there. If we then move and shift to what did we actually get out of our, um, animals as far as value. Um, this is a, an overall summary. Again, this is not perfect because um, I'm making some approximations on a couple things here, but pretty close overall. This does not account for any processing. Uh, fees processing would be on top of these. 
We based a lot of our pricing off of average USDA pasture raised pricing. That's how we, we set stuff. So um, I got some, you know, some negative feedback on the price points earlier from folks, but this is where, you know, the market is for stuff that's raised in this type of fashion. I know this is higher than what is in a confinement barn. We're not trying to compete with confinement barns. Um, that's, that's just not our jam uh, in what we're doing here. So the reality is, is the, that's, you know, where the market is set for consumers that are wanting to, uh, to have stuff raised in this fashion. So uh, because of that, we end up with a total revenue per barn based off of the stocking rates and the hanging, uh, the average hanging weights that we had for our animals of about $10,400 per barn acre. So where does that leave us overall for a barn acre of stock crop or profitability? So total revenue of 10.4, uh, total expenses of about 82. So that leaves us, you know, somewhere between twenty-one to twenty-two hundred dollars of profit uh, per barn per acre. Um, so a really nice, uh, a really nice profit. Um, to be honest with you, I'm disappointed in that number. Um, I was hoping it was going to be almost double of that, uh, but I've got some reasons why that didn't happen in ways that we can improve. I'm going to touch on. So then let's talk about, you know, the other part of the stock cropper is the row crop system, right? And so. Then we have to go through and look at, well, what did our corn enterprise uh, yield? Because that's, that's half, of, uh, half of the system right there. So we estimated we had about $650 an acre uh, across all of our, our input costs. We did have higher seed and higher nitrogen uh, usage um, in trying to push that outside row effect with higher seed populations on the outside row, higher nitrogen rates on the outside row. So we had higher expense uh, from those um, attributes that we would not have in our conventional corn setup. So we accounted for that into our numbers here. We also attributed zero dollars in fertility in the fact that, uh, you know, in this system, the animals are going to be providing uh, a majority of the fertility outside of probably nitrogen that we would have to supplement. Um, so that is a, an added benefit and reduct, uh, reduction of expense there. I usually put on about $65 an acre uh, in uh, fertility through my strip till rig every year if you're trying to figure out how that would pencil in normally. So, uh, but when you look at what we had, you know, we got the, uh, a relatively decent yield bump from uh, the system. So 262 bushel corn is um, what we got. And you take that times about four bucks a bushel for, uh, you know, fall price, what things are now, you come up with about $1,048 net profit on the corn of almost $400 an acre in this system. So if we would have done nothing, if the stock cropper wouldn't have existed this year, what, what did regular corn look like to compare that to? Well, so again, I had to add my fertility back into regular corn and then lessen the seed and the nitrogen inputs. Um, you know, a couple years ago when I did the intercrop uh, versus conventional uh, corn block comparison, it was about a 50 bushel advantage to intercropping at that point. Um, and so I have kind of assumed the same thing. So I just put in a factor of 210 bushel, which I think is uh, relatively safe considering how dry we were for what corn on corn uh, would have been in our neighborhood. Did the math out on that, ends up with a net profit of about 165 bucks uh, an acre on that enterprise. So when you add the, the sum of our corn enterprise and our stock cropper pasture enterprise together and average that out across the two acres that we had the system set up on, uh, you know, you end up, you have a, a barn profit of $21.75. You've got about $400 uh, an acre in corn profit. That equates up to about $25, $2,600. You divide that by two, almost $1,300 uh, an acre of average profit of the system itself. So compare that to if we would have just done third year corn on corn, got 210 bushel corn, got lucky and got four bucks instead of three like it was a year ago. You're looking at uh, a production profit level, you know, roughly somewhere between seven to eight times um, greater than uh, conventional corn or just monocrops versus stacking enterprises and growing pasture raised pigs, chickens, sheep, goats, um, and cross leveraging and getting some of the, the added benefits of intertwining uh, those different biological systems together. That's where it essentially shakes out. 
So the good news is, is you know, we kind of reached that initial goal. Uh, the system worked out, the stacking of enterprises gave us the opportunity um, to realize a, a net profit um, significantly higher than what uh, our commodity-based system. And that's what we we're going for. We were trying to find a system where uh, smaller farmers or any size farmer for that matter uh, would have the ability to differentiate with something other than a commodity. You know, commodities are always designed to end up being a, a break-even proposition at best, uh, long-term over time. You know, we have a food policy in this country that uh, that rewards uh, or, I guess, promotes uh, a cheap food, you know, uh, policy and situation. And uh, if we're going to continue to operate in that space, you have to uh, realize that uh, you're not going to be left with a lot, especially with all the consolidation, the funnel that I've talked about uh in this business that's gonna happen in the next 10 years. Um, that's why we came up and did this, and that's why we really wanted to try to differentiate uh, the stock cropper from that system uh, as we move forward into the future. So with that being said, you know, uh, it's great that we did this on two acres, but you know, what what is really the challenges in scaling? And there's a lot, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, you know, stock cropping has a long ways to go. Um, you know, this was our first year. We're going to do more testing this next year to try to uh, to try to address some of those challenges and figure those things out. But I can guarantee you, the solutions are not going to come in uh, thinking about things like the way that we currently think or the way that we used to think about stuff. It's going to have to take outside of the box thinking to solve the problems to make something like this work. There's just no other way around it. So I want to talk about some of the vulnerabilities um, that I have identified you know and the biggest one is is it assumes that you can market at a premium price point if i try to sell this at uh, commodity uh you know pig or chicken prices it just simply does not work it also assumes that you've got to have a, a spot to be able to process or butcher you know these animals uh it was relatively uh, not a big deal when i only had 10 pigs um you know to do i was able to get slots for uh, for eight of those and i butchered two myself we butchered most of our chickens and I've got, uh, we've been doing the sheep processing ourselves. So that's, those are numbers that, uh, you know, that we can manage. But if you're going to, you know, gear this up, the processing thing really becomes an issue. And that's something that I have been working a lot on in the background with trying to come up with ways around that to solve that problem. Some of the other problems uh, or issues in our numbers, you know, we didn't have anything for death loss. Uh, really factored. And I'm sure there's going to be plenty of people that watch this that go through and will find things that they don't like about my numbers. And that's that's fine. I know that there's weaknesses um, in those things and I welcome the criticisms and the challenge. So with that stuff being said, I did indicate there's opportunity um, in this thing yet that we haven't really realized. And there were some things that we screwed up on this year uh, just in the trying to pull this all off. Uh, you know, we were learning on the fly. We were trying to still develop a lot of stuff like the electrical advancement that we debuted at our field day. You know, that stuff just took time and focus. And, uh, um, you know, just with not having control over the processing window, you know, we, we literally got our pigs in about 10 days. We got a booking date 10 days before um, the, the booking date opened up. And so we had to send them in early. So I wanted to talk through some of the things where our numbers can improve. I honestly think that there's room to double uh, the profitability of the system if we do things better um, and give us more fudge factor in there to account for some of those other issues. So I'm gonna talk through that. So a couple of things that we, uh, uh, that we were light on, our stocking rates of chickens um, can be higher. Um, we didn't, uh, uh, you know, we didn't have as many chickens out there as what we could, and that would add to the bottom line. I think we could probably uh, add another 50 to 100 chickens uh, per acre uh, very easily. I'm also thinking about changing uh, the design of the chicken tractors to give them more room, more fresh vegetation. That's all part of the thought for next year. The other thing, the finished weights of our pigs. We only had 180 um, pound hanging weights on average for our hogs. and that's light from the way that I like to really raise these animals. I would much rather have them up closer to a, a 210 to 220 range for hanging weight. It allows the, the finishing and the marbling of that pasture raised animal. I really like growing them up to, you know, 310 to 330 pound hogs. And that makes a big difference when you're, when you don't have those pounds uh, on the carcass at, at the end uh, to, to, uh, to add to the bottom line there. And so, um, 
you know, and then the other thing I'll say is just our marketing efforts, you know. I didn't spend a lot of time marketing this stuff. It was mainly just a couple asks, and uh, we really didn't get into the key demographics of where uh, the people that are interested in this stuff and paying these price points, um, they don't necessarily live in Buffalo Center, Iowa. And so that's one thing that if this is going to go, that we've got to be able to find more creative paths to get that stuff done ahead of time and have the animals sold before it possibly even hit the field. That's really the end goal of this whole thing. Um, other opportunities. So I've talked in a couple of videos about wanting to grow our, you know, the feed stuff or the, the row crop being the feed stuff for the following year, op opening up the opportunity to process our own feed on site. So instead of having to, you know, truck the corn to a plant, have them mill it, you know, we would just have in a bin and process it ourselves and make our own mixes. And then instead of selling the corn down the road, uh, you know, to the ethanol plant as a commodity, we would put it back through the animals and walk it off at a much higher value um, proposition than uh, turning it into uh, uh, an additive for gasoline or DDGs or, you know, what have you, what I normally do with my corn. The other opportunity too that we don't have is the fact that we bought all of our animals, all of our feeder animals or our chicks. Um, we had to buy those from someone else. And so um, I do have you know, plans, I guess, if this thing is to, to continue to grow is that we need to get uh, you know, breeding stock on site to be able to, uh, to come up and background our own animals and uh, be more efficient on the cost side there. So those are just a couple of the things uh, that I have in mind on how I think that these numbers can get um, juicier than where they are and help buffer some of the things that I have probably not taken into account uh, and some of the criticism, criticisms I'll likely get from this video, which is fine because uh, I know that those things are there and um, that's how you, you grow. You throw it out there and you have people tear it apart and uh, you learn and you move on and that's that's why I'm making this video. So that's it. That's the, uh, the summation of numbers uh, for the project for 2020. I hope uh, you enjoy and appreciate um, me throwing it out and sharing it. I welcome the criticism. I welcome uh, any compliments. Um, I just want to learn and get better with this. So uh, whoever is interested in participating in that, I welcome uh, the dialogue here as we move forward. I just want to say uh, before I end, thank you so much for anyone that followed this project in 2020. This was a, a surreal year for a lot of reasons, um, but this project uh, brought a smile to my face about every day and especially through the connections I made with folks. So if you've reached out, if you just followed the project or liked tweets or um, you know, joined our Facebook page or uh, you bought animals from us, sincerely Thank you uh, for for being a part of this uh, ride here in the in the last season. So, uh, a couple final things I'll make mention of. I am uh, looking potentially for an intern or two to help with the project next summer. So, if you know anyone that's college age that'd be interested in helping with something like this, uh, I would really appreciate it. The other thing, the last ask I would have here at the end of the video is, if you have not subscribed to the YouTube, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. I really want to get to a thousand subscribers uh, before we hit the field uh, this spring. Um, that was one goal we didn't quite get to. And I know there's a lot of people that watch that haven't subscribed. I can see that in the stats in the background. So the reason I want to get to this point is I want to be able to live stream video. It's not because I want to monetize or turn into the next millennial farmer. Uh, I have no interest in that stuff. I just want to be able to flip our live stream on. So please give uh, a subscribe, uh, hit the button down below so that we can do that. Uh, that's it. Again, thank you for uh, your attention over the last uh, almost 11 months. I'm really, really excited um, for what we've got coming in 2021. And uh, from my family, um, on behalf of Sheldon and Juice and Lance and anyone that's participated in this project or been a part of it, uh, best wishes for a great 2021. Happy New Year, everyone.